are looking first at 1 Kings, the 19th chapter. But before I read that, let me just ask you, how is your personal walk with the Lord going? How is your personal walk with the Lord? See, your personal walk with the Lord may not be at the same area or the same pace or the same place as my personal walk. But I think it's a healthy thing for us to gather in a collective setting today with other believers and to just simply ask ourselves, how's my walk with the Lord going? How much time have you spent walking with the Lord this week? It's been two or three minutes? Or has it been several minutes or maybe even an hour or two since last week? How much time we spend with the Lord and where we are in our walk with the Lord says a whole lot about how we handle life, how we handle the problems, how we handle the issues of life. I can say that from a personal perspective, and I think that you all would agree. How many times have you heard someone say upon asking them, how are you doing? And their reply is, I am blessed. You ever heard that? I would like to think that all of us could be able to say that. I am blessed. Sometimes we forget just how blessed we are. Someone said God's people never really has a bad day. Now there may be difficult things that we have to deal with that come down the pipe. But if we are God's people, the way that we deal with it, and not being able to stand alone, as Darren just said a few minutes ago, puts a whole new perspective on the problems of life. Well, have you ever heard of a guy by the name of Elijah? We're going to be reading this in, in just a moment. But the passage that we're beginning with in the 19th chapter of 1 Kings, started with verse 4, really breaks into a series of amazing events there in the life of Elijah. A few years earlier, Arab had become the king of Israel. And actually, he turns out to be one of the most wicked kings that Israel had ever had. Now, he, along with his wicked wife, Jezebel, they began working together to promote idol worshiping. It was under God's direction that Elijah told Ahab that there would be no rain upon the land. It will not rain except at the word of Elijah. All he would have to do was to pray to God, let the rains come. And God held back the rain, if you recall this story, for three years. A great famine broke out, as you might imagine. Three years, no rain, all across the land. But just before Elijah, just before this, Elijah has a showdown at Mount Carmel against the 450 prophets of Baal. And God sent the fire down from heaven and consumed Elijah's sacrifice. Now here Elijah was up against the 450 prophets of Baal, and he killed all 450 with his sword. He prayed to God for rain, and the rains came. Let's read, started with verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. Now, I don't know if you know what a broom tree is. It's a juniper tree, okay? And the King James refers to this as a juniper tree, and I like the juniper tree better. And he asked that he might die, saying, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a juniper tree. 
And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. Again, the Lord providing for his needs here. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for ye. And he rose and ate and drank and went in the strength of the food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. May God add his blessings to the reading, the proclamation, the understanding of his holy and blessed word. When I think, when I read about Mount Horeb, I tell you what will always come to my mind. I'm sure I've told you this before. But when I was on the trip to the Holy Land some eight years ago, Bobby Bowden, who had been the coach of Florida State football team, Florida State Seminoles, he gave a message there at Mount Horeb. And I will never forget what he said, how he said it, and his love and his witness. And if you know anything about Bobby Bowden, I've got two of his books. He certainly lived out his faith and carried that faith into his coaching career. Had a very illustrious uh, career because of that. So when I read about Mount Horeb, I think about that event. So the Bible tells us here that Elijah plopped down under a juniper tree and asked God to just kill him. Just let me die. Now, folks, this is the same man here that you might recall just hours before was calling down fire from heaven. Now we find him in despair. God provided for his need, provided food and drink. He went back to sleep. And God told him to arise again. And we see him in that despair. We need to know. He needs to know that, that the same God that has met him in the light is the same God that will meet him in his darkness. We need to understand that too. It's easy for us to come, to come together on a Sunday morning. It's easy for us to go through our activities in the week. It's easy for us to glorify God and sing praises to his name when everything is going fine. But what about when things aren't going good? What about those times when we find ourselves in um, the darkness? So what's happening here? What is the reason for his despair? There's a couple of things I would suspect. First of all, I see fear. Fear, and then you couple that with a sense of weariness. We're told that he had just ran all the way from the summit of Mount Carmel to the valley of Jezreel. When your body is tired, you're more susceptible to desperation. You're more susceptible to depression. So, are there times in our lives when we experience the ups and downs as Christians? Do we experience that? Can I say one way or another? I think all of us will admit there's times when we feel much like Isaiah here. Are there times when friends will drop you? When friends will shoot arrows at your heart and say things and do things that will hurt you? Yes, things like that happen. Will there come times when your test, when your face is being tested and you realize that you've got to stand on the foundation of your faith? Yes, there will be times when you must do that. So if we know that we're in the light, but yet there's going to be those times of darkness, how do we prepare for that? How do we keep from finding ourselves like Isaiah, from getting into the rut, from feeling like life is not necessary, I'd just rather die than live? How do we prepare for that? Well, first, let me tell you that the same God, or let me remind you that the same God that we worship here on a Sunday morning, when things seem to be going pretty good, is the same God that we worship in the midst of our darkness. God is with us at every moment. He doesn't keep us standing alone. 
we need to keep reaching out. We need to keep believing. We know what we say we believe. Sometimes we're put to the test. You know, I've learned some things in my own life. I've learned some things about going from the peaks, the, the high points, the summit, the great adventures of life, down to the valleys. I've been there. There's not a one of you that haven't been there. I have learned that fear, fear can be one of the greatest causes of falling and failing. I've also learned that there's reasons why we go through storms. I've got to step back and look at things. Why am I going through this? I mean, is there something God is trying to tell me? I think that's true for any of us. I think that's true for all of us. I think we know that. I just think we need to be reminded of that. I've also learned that we can so easily be deceived. And that great deceiver, Satan himself, will work in our lives and try to get underneath us and, and, and bring us to a point of desperation and depression. I've also learned that when things aren't going good, sometimes we get out of focus. Sometimes we focus on the wrong things. I've also learned a little bit about patience. Patience is not just simply waiting around and just hanging tough. Patience goes a whole lot deeper. It's remaining joyful and steadfast in faithfulness. Now, the only way to produce fruit is by consistency. So look, look at your life. Look at where you are right now in your walk, in your journey with the Lord. Are you producing fruit in your life? If you're not producing fruit as a Christian, if we're not bearing fruit, then we need to step back and look, hold it, something's not right. Last Thursday, I was with a gentleman that I was meeting with Thursday night, and it just so happened that a local apple orchard owner was in that same restaurant that, that we all know. And after I introduced him to this gentleman and told him that he had apple trees here, they got to talking there for a few minutes. And he talked about the key to growing and raising apples and apple trees is consistency. And I thought, wow, that really ties in to what I'm going to be talking about Sunday. If we're going to be fruitful, we've got to be faithful. There's got to be a consistency in our walk and in our relationship with the Lord. You can't come here on a Sunday morning, I've told you this a million times over the years, and expect me to dish it all out to you, and you have everything you need until next Sunday at the same appointed hour. But that's what's happening in way too many people's lives. They, they don't have a consistent walk, a, a daily walk with the Lord, and because of that, they're not fruitful, and we cannot bear fruit if there's not some kind of consistency. We long for that peace. All of us want peace, but we need to have the right perspective. I have written, and this really wasn't uh, something that had come across. It wasn't one of that list of things I like to say, but I had this written in one of my Bibles. Peace is the umpire of our heart. Is there any one of us that don't long for peace? We all want a sense of peace. But what about perspective? Perspective is the way we look at the situation. And our perspective on any given situation will determine if we are fruitful, if we are producing fruit, or if we are frustrated. Fruitfulness, frustration. We want peace, we long for peace, but we've got to have that right perspective. See, some people don't glorify God as God, as that almighty, all-powerful, sovereign being. And they want God to be their good friend. They want God to be their buddy. In fact, they like to go to God and to advise him on what to do at certain situations. 
rather than honoring God for who he is. Now, when we stay focused, then we honor God for just that, for being in God. Our purpose as we gather here Sunday after Sunday, whether it's Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, continue to have your consistent walk with the Lord. There you're growing. There you're becoming more fruitful, more productive in your life, in your own ministry. See, some of you think that I'm the only one that has ministry, or, or maybe Darren with the music ministry, or other teachers. Every one of us have a ministry out there in our own walk every day in dealing with people. We need to live our lives by serving others, by meeting the needs of others, by encouraging others, by lifting others up, by doing good for others. That's where we become productive because we're bearing fruit. A lot of this goes back to our own perspective. How do we respond to storms? The storms in our own life. And I realize that I stand, as I stand before you today, over the years, I've seen a lot of you all go through some pretty difficult storms. Storms that were hard to handle, hard to deal with. But I also look at you, and because I know where you are in your faith and in your consistency, in your walk, you've been able to deal with that in a way that those without hope cannot. You probably don't have a clean sheet of paper in front of you, but I want to encourage you when you get home today to take a a sheet of paper, okay? Eight by ten or whatever. Take a sheet of paper, and I want you to take your ink pen and put a dot somewhere on that paper. Just put a black dot on that paper. And then I want you to look at it. What do you see? If I were to come to you and say, okay, what do you see here on this paper? I I see a dot. That's what we're focusing on. We forget about all the other white there. And see, that's the way it is with with life. See, we like to focus on that one thing, or maybe it's two or three things, instead of looking at the whole picture and seeing all that we have been blessed with. You see, life has a way, oftentimes, of distracting us by causing us to focus on those small things. And we can't be productive because we keep pounding on this instead of looking at this. There's so much more. We forget to count our blessings. Blessings that come right straight from God. I came across this phrase, and this really became... Part of this became the title of my sermon today. As you travel down life's pathway, may this ever be your goal. Keep your eye upon the donut and not upon the hoe. That's our problem. We're not looking at the donut. We're looking at the hoe. We're looking at life. We're looking at that emptiness in life instead of looking at the donut. Now, that may very well be our problem. We're looking at the wrong, we're focusing on the wrong, we're focusing on the hole and not the donut. See, we realize the worth of an anchor when the storms come. Ever been on a boat? And a storm comes up, and that anchor makes you feel much more secure. If we were to turn over to the sixth chapter of Luke, and I don't know that that's up on the screen, uh, but as you look at the sixth chapter of Luke, and I made reference to this in the nine o'clock service this morning, uh, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he's talking about the storms of life coming upon us. And the house that we read about there, the house that is built on a solid foundation or one that is built upon sand. You know, if we've got a solid foundation, then that's going to be our anchor. If you read between the lines of what Jesus is saying right there, he's talking about doing the word. We talk a lot about reading the word, 
But reading the word, hearing the word is not the same as doing the word. We need to be faithful. And if there's any one thing that I could change about the church, and I'm not just talking about our church, I think it's an overall problem in talking with other ministers. It's the faithfulness in the church. You've got those that are always going to be faithful. They will be here come rain or shine. And then you've got others that, well, if I feel like going, I'll go. There's no consistency in their life. And because there's no consistency, they're not producing any fruit. And I don't know of too many things worse than a non-bearing Christian. We know what we need to do. We hear what we need to do. But we're not doing what we need to do. You can see the hoe and you focus on that. But you forget about the donut. See, the advantage of doing the word is summed up right there in that same passage there in the sixth chapter of Luke, verse 48. The house shall not be shaken because it is on the rock. Like a man building a house who dug a deep foundation. And I don't remember the rest of that, okay? But it was up there. I hope you were a fast reader, okay? All right? But the house that is built upon a solid rock will not be shaken. Now, every one of us get into situations where we get discouraged. We, we talk about Elisha, and we see the discouragement that he experienced. But he's not the only one in the Old Testament that experienced that. There's plenty of people that went through similar situations. In fact, we go all the way over to the New Testament, we can find just as many people there. I think about the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was so discouraged in his troubles there in Asia, he was worn out, and he thought about giving up on life. You know, I've got a lot of favorite scriptures, but I'm not too sure if this right here is not going to become one of my favorite ones. Just real short. It came to pass. It came to pass. I'm glad that I can look at the situations of my life and they didn't come to stay. They came to pass. Those things will pass. But having the proper perspective in the storms of life is so important. What did the Apostle Paul say in 2 Corinthians 4, 8? We are troubled on every side, yet not discouraged. We are perplexed, but yet not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are cast down, but not destroyed. How can he say that? How can we say that? Because we know the word, but more importantly, we do the word. I told the 9 o'clock service this morning, it wasn't in my notes. I say a lot of things it's not in my notes. That's why you have a longer sermon, okay? What did I tell the 9 o'clock service this morning? <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Uh, th there are times that people can quote scripture. I know I knew a preacher. He's not even living now. I was quite impressed. Man, he could, he could quote scripture. He could embarrass me by quoting so much scripture. But I knew some things. And he wasn't living it out. I don't care how much you know. I don't really care how much you quote. I think what does matter, and what certainly matters to God, is how much we live out. Living out God's word. The apostle Paul knew that. He had been in situations like that before, and he knew those situations were going to come again. But he stood firm on that foundation. I find it amazing that the apostle Paul, I find it amazing that, that Isaiah and so many others did not just wallow in their self-pity. Yes, they got there, but they got out. Some people get stuck in that mode of depression and despair, and they can't get out. It didn't happen to Elijah, and it didn't happen to Paul, and there was a reason why. Let me close out with this story. I may very well have told this story before. I know I've told it. I tell a lot of stories at a lot of places, and whether I've told it to you all, I'm not sure. 
but it's a true story. Back when I was having all those dental implants that I had, and I was going to Dr. Jones down in downtown Louisville in the Stark Building, and some of you probably been around long enough to know where the Stark Building is. It was a very famous building in its day and time. But Dr. Jones's uh, office was on the seventh or eighth floor, and I remember getting in an elevator, and the elevator got stuck. How many have been on a stuck elevator? Not a happy feeling, is it? Now, I was on there with other people. I just sort of was amazed. What do we do from here? I didn't push the panic button. I might be late for my appointment, but I didn't push the panic button. Now, some of them in that elevator with me did. Some of them, one or two got out of control. And I tried to gather their emotions because it's hold, hold it a second okay I don't know how this thing stopped I don't know how to get it started but I do know what I can do and I reached over there and pulled that door open and grabbed that receiver and it connected in with security I says I'm on some elevator here with about five other people and we're stuck okay what floor are you stuck on I think it was the fourth or fifth floor We'll be right there. So they came. They did something manually. And the best I remember, I took the steps the next time I went. <laughs> now, what do you do? When situations come our way that we don't really like or we don't really want or we don't welcome, it's so easy to push that panic button. But it's also easy particularly if we've got a consistent walk with the Lord to pick up that receiver called prayer. Say, okay, God, I need your help. I need you to rescue me. And guess what? He will. Let's pray.